Okay, greetings brothers and sisters. Um, this is the video that I'm doing on the third letter written to the churches in Revelation. Now that is the letter to Pergamum. Okay, so um, the letter to Pergamum. Let me just get everything open here, my notes and the piece that I need to read. Okay, so we've looked at the letter to Ephesus, then we looked at the letter to the church in Smyrna, and now we are going to look at the letter to the church in Pergamon. Now, um, if you hear noise in the background, please just excuse it. It's um, my neighbor has, um, what do you call them, macaws. And they are in their cage outside and they're making quite a noise. So please excuse that. He's got something like, I think, seven or eight different types of parrots. So please excuse the noise in the background. <clears throat> um, the church in Pergamum, the letter to the church in Pergamum is Revelation 2. And um, that is from verse 12 to verse 17. Okay. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Okay. Now, the, every time in the word of God when you hear about a sharp double-edged sword, then you should think of uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12, that tells you about the word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword. And you should also think about Revelation chapter 19, where it is said that, the um, Jesus has the uh, as a sword, okay, and then together with that we read in Ephesians six, we we read as part of the spiritual armor, as part of the armor of God. Um, one of the pieces is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, because the word of God is the way in which we counter attack. We block attacks with our faith, having faith in the Lord. That's how we counter the enemy. Um, that's how we defend ourselves against the enemy and then launching counter-attacks with the sword, sword of the Spirit uh, which is the Word of God so quoting scripture the moment you the moment Satan attacks you and you quote scripture you are confronting him with the truth of God okay that's what Jesus also did in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan tempted him in the wilderness Satan quoted scripture, but he quoted it out of context. Jesus quoted scripture within context. Okay, so we should all, all always be vigilant and ask the Lord for discernment by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit so that we can distinguish between scripture being quoted in context and scripture being quoted out of context. Okay, because the moment you have scripture out of context, then it becomes a pretext for false teaching. Okay. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. So the one who has the sharp double-edged sword is Jesus, because Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Okay. Now, this is very important. The church in Pergamum, there was a throne of Satan, constructed there it was a physical throne but you would be wrong in separating the physical from the spiritual here okay it's a physical throne that was constructed there it was to honor the god known as zeus all right now zeus was also known as jupiter interestingly enough if you go deep into the new age and you um lend your ears out to false uh, New Age um, people like David Icke, uh, Jordan Maxwell, um, who's that other guy? He's passed away long ago, but he got like a little grey beard and he's got quite long hair. He, uh, David Icke, Icke was influenced by him a lot. I can't remember his name. And also Alice Bailey and all those. Um, and I'm pretty sure Elena Blavatsky teaches the same, but they will tell you that Zeus, also known as Jupiter, is actually Jesus. That's the lie that they tell you. 
So, you see the confusion this brings. If you don't have discernment, if you're not a born-again Christian who don't have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, then obviously you'll think, okay, Christianity is just another fake religion. Um, they basically borrowed from mythology and, you know, there's no point in following it. So, the fact that Zeus is also Jupiter and Jupiter is, uh, the lie is told in the New Age that Jupiter is Jesus, um, is very significant here because remember what we are dealing with. Throughout Revelation, we are dealing with an upbuilding and an upbuilding and an upbuilding to a certain climax where the Antichrist appears on the earth and he has the false prophet. And then we go on, we go on, and, and then we reach the ultimate climax where Jesus Christ comes back and he destroys Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and they are all thrown into the lake of fire along with all their followers and their kingdom and everything. Okay? So, uh, the, the throne of Satan was actually the throne of Zeus. All right? But the Bible doesn't mince any words. The Bible calls it what it is. It says it's the throne of Satan. Now, what I want you to pay attention to here is um, in September 2023, I think it was on the 23rd of September 2023, I wrote an article on Facebook and it was titled Throne of Destruction. Um, I will put the link to the article on Facebook uh, in the description of this video for those who want to go and read it. But what, what it basically comes down to is the throne of Satan is the key construct in this regard. Because the throne of Satan is a counterfeit throne that is a counterfeit of the throne of David on which Jesus Christ as the Messiah will be seated in the New Jerusalem. Remember that Satan as a fallen cherub cannot create anything. The only thing he can do is he can imitate, in other words, he can create counterfeits. And the second thing he can do very well is he can destroy. So imitation and destruction, those are his specialties. Okay. Now, if you go to um, Psalm 94, Psalm 94. In Psalm 94, we see the following. Um, they talk about God who avenges. They talk about the wicked and the wicked get what they deserve. They get what they deserve. And then in verse 20, they talk about a throne. Now, different translations translate verse 20 differently. The throne... Um, the, the Bible I have here says, Can a corrupt throne be allied with you? A throne that brings on misery by its decrees. Now, the King James Version, um, if I'm not mistaken, translates it as a throne of iniquity. Um, other translations, I think the Revised Version of 1885 translates it as a throne of wickedness or something like that. But the, the um, translation that translates it the best is the LEB, the Lexham English Bible. The Lexham <coughs> English Bible along with the literal standard version are amongst the most literal Bible translations that you will get. Um, not always easy to read, but it's very literally translated. Even more, it's considered more literal than the New American Standard Bible. Um, the Lexham English Bible says in verse 20, Can a throne of destruction be allied with you? So, in the Lexham English Bible, it, talks, it, it um, calls the throne of Satan the throne of destruction. You can call it the throne of destruction, you can call it the throne of iniquity, the throne of wickedness, the throne of corruption. But for me personally, throne of destruction as the Lexham English Bible translates it, is very significant because that's what the empire of darkness, the Antichrist empire of the end times, will flourish on. 
And the thing is, they won't do it very blatantly. It won't be destruction on a blatant, um, easy to see basis. It will be destruction sometimes blatantly, but most of the times indirectly, and most and majority of the time it will be subtle. It it will be done very cleverly and very subtly. And those who don't have discernment won't be able to see through it. That's why Jesus also said, if if I did not, if God the Father did not um, make the time shorter, if, they, if He did not shorten the days, then even the elect would be deceived. So that's how clever the schemes of the kingdom of darkness will be. Please note, I'm not giving them any credit, but I'm just saying, um, they, they have already lost the battle, but Revelation 12 verse 12 tells us that the Satan has, for, has come down to the earth and he's angry. Okay? Because he knows his time is short. He knows it's a short time before Jesus will return. <clears throat> so he wants to sow as much destruction as he can in this time. And that's why he does it in a very clever way, very crafty way, and so on. So I'm not giving him any credit or the Antichrist any credit or anything. I'm just saying that they are not stupid. Okay? If you think they're stupid, then you're clearly um, underestimating them. Okay? Don't underestimate the enemy. Know that the enemy um, has already lost, but don't underestimate them. Okay? Don't, uh, don't think that... Uh, we don't need to know anything about them or so on. Okay. <clears throat> now he says where the throne of Satan is. Now this is like a throne of destruction. Which is, which is a counterfeit throne of the throne of David. You'll see in Psalm 46. Psalm 46 verse 4 to 5. It talks about a city. Which where the rivers, the streams make glad. Okay. In Ezekiel 47 verses 1 to 12 and also in Revelation 22, you'll see that it talks about the throne of God and it talks about um, the New Jerusalem and it says that streams of living water flows forth from the city. And it flows into the sea and it makes the salt water fresh water. So the living water which is the Holy Spirit, brings life. Now you can just imagine if Satan uh, puts a, constructs a counterfeit throne, then what will flow forth from that throne? A river of death. Death, destruction and so on. If you do a, 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 a study on Satan from a Christian perspective and you go and look at the research of, of Derek Gilbert then you'll see in Derek Gilbert, Gilbert's research um, he makes a very good case for Satan actually his, his real name is Baal okay um, in the Old Testament he's called Baal Baal and Satan is the same entity the Catholic Church teaches that Baal is one of the crown princes of hell that's below Satan and that's not true. Satan is not a name, it's a job description. It means adversary or um, adversary or um, accuser. Okay? So his name, Satan is his title, but his name, according to the research of Derek Gilbert, is Baal. Alright. Now, <clears throat> Baal constructs a counterfeit throne. Why exactly a counterfeit throne? It's a counterfeit throne on which the Antichrist will be seated and he will sit in the house of God. What does the Apostle Paul tell us in his letters to the Thessalonians? He says, he will sit in the house of God and he will pretend to be God. So he will sit on a throne of destruction also and pretend that he is this uh, beneficial world leader. And he will do wonderful things. We know that the book of Revelation is very clear about that. He will do wonderful things, the Antichrist, and people will think, oh my goodness, this is the man. This, this is the guy. You know, this is the guy that we've been waiting for. But he's a false messiah. 
Okay, that's the sad part of it. So many will fall for the for the, the, the poison that drips from the tongue of the false messiah, the Antichrist. Okay? And he's actually so insignificant. He's powerful, but at the same time so insignificant in the sense that he cannot fight directly against Jesus. Because Paul also tells us that when Jesus appears as the lion of the tribe of Judah with his second coming, what will he do? He will destroy the Antichrist with what? With the breath of his mouth. The breath of his mouth is the Neshema, it's the life-giving force, it's the breath of life that God also breathed into human beings at creation. Okay, Go look at Genesis 2 verse 7 said he formed man from the from the dirt of the ground and he blew the breath of life in hebrew that is neshama now the life that jesus gives is so magnificently strong that by the mere breath of his mouth which breathes the breath of life he will destroy the antichrist that's how almighty jesus is we can't comprehend it with our human understanding okay um Note also in the letter to Pergamum, he says to them, okay, there's the throne of um, the throne of Satan is there, but despite the throne of Satan being there, the throne of destruction, the throne of Zeus, okay, despite it being there, he said, you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Antipas was a Christian martyr who was murdered in Pergamum because um, he refused to renounce Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. You see, the problem is the moment you eat food sacrificed to idols and you didn't pray beforehand and ask God to cleanse the food, then... Um, Remember that you are actually partaking in the practices of darkness. Okay? And obviously sexual immorality. We know that the Bible is very clear on that. Okay? Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, I've mentioned them before, they were a sect who um, taught, basically taught Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism, the key principle of Gnosticism, and it's interesting that the New Age teachings of David Ike, Jordan Maxwell, and others also flourishes on Gnosticism. Gnosticism says that knowledge is above everything. But what does Colossians 2 verse 3 teach us? What does Colossians 2 verse 3 say about knowledge? Let's go and look at Colossians 2 verse 3. You know, when I'm studying by myself at home and I have to find a verse, then I find it easily. But when I have to find it quickly in front of people, then I'm, I'm not so good at it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Colossians 2 verses 2 and 3. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, now listen very carefully to verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So according to the Bible, the Lord says my people perishes due to lack of knowledge. Gnostics will usually quote that verse out of context and tell you, you see, knowledge is important, but you don't get saved due to knowledge. You can know the whole Bible from front to end. You can memorize it and, um, you know, quoted from from memory but if you don't have a relationship with the lord jesus christ as your lord and savior then obviously you are lost so knowledge the bible says knowledge is good but it is knowledge and wisdom that is found in jesus christ not any other wisdom or knowledge not the wisdom of the new age the knowledge of the new age the knowledge of gnosticism whatever 
um, the knowledge found in Eastern mysticism or um, whatever. Okay, it's knowledge, the, the the knowledge and wisdom hidden as treasures in Jesus Christ. That's the knowledge and the wisdom that people need to have. And that's why God the Father said in the Old Testament to Hosea, my, my people perish for lack of knowledge. What he meant was, they don't have enough knowledge of me. Their spiritual knowledge is pathetic. They think they can be rescued by worldly wisdom. You see. So, in other words, the Nicolaitans were a cult that said, as long as you have earthly wisdom and you have earthly um, knowledge of things, then you're okay. Okay, that's typically what New Age teachers like, especially Jordan Maxwell, will also tell you. Knowledge is important. Okay, and the problem with earthly knowledge is it causes you to be puffed up, it causes you to be prideful, and pride was one of the main reasons why Satan was cast out of heaven. Remember, he was a cherub first. And that's also why he creates a counterfeit throne, the throne of Satan, the throne of destruction, the throne of iniquity, the throne of wickedness, whatever you want to call it, in Pergamum, because he was one of the cherubs that was next to the throne of God. He was in the vicinity of the throne of God. So he had time to study the throne of God. And go and look at his I will statements in Isaiah um, 14. I think it's verses 12 to 14. One of his I will, sta I will statements is, I will um, ascend above the throne of God. That's another way of saying, I will create a counterfeit throne that looks like the throne of God. And I will tell people, don't look at the throne of God, look at this throne. Look at me. I will give you everything. And sadly, a lot of people will fall for that. The problem with Gnosticism is it ends up in a, a reverence of the self. Me, myself, I. And that is that is what ties it uh, indirectly with the, the philosophy of Satan. And that's also what you find in Satanism. Okay, they worship Satan, but... It comes to a point where Satan tells you, listen, you worship me, but I will make you your own God. You are a God. Now, this relates to um, the teachings of, uh, of obscure occult groups like Fraternita Saturni. Fraternita Saturni is a German occult group, um, one of the most secretive groups in the world. Um, Fraternita Saturni means the brotherhood of Saturn, okay, and um, they say that when you join them, you are vibrating in a lower octave, and then they see that as the lower plane of the planet Saturn, and they say the more knowledge you gain, the more, the higher you ascend, and then you ascend to the level of the higher octave, and then you vibrate in a higher octave, in a higher frequency, and they call the lower frequency Satan, and they call the higher frequency Lucifer, the light bringer. Because then you have the light of knowledge, which is obviously a counterfeit light. It's a light with which Satan is counterf is, is he created he he, um, he imitates the light of Christ. Okay, he imitates Christ as the light of the world. He imitates the word of God as the light that drives away the darkness. He creates a counterfeit light, a false light, okay? He imitates the light by producing a false light. And he's trying to tell people this is the true light. And it's, it's tragic how many people fall for that lie. It's absolutely horrifying. Um, in pagan mythology, in the occult and so on, they will tell you that... Zeus displaced Saturn because Saturn was the demiurge who presided over the golden age. Now the golden age, as the pagans call it, was the time before the flood. When the watchers came down, they had sexual relations with the women, 
the Nephilim, the giants were born and there was chaos and destruction on the earth. The pagans see that as a golden age. For them it was something wonderful. They have this very romantic idea about it. And according to them, Saturn will return, displace Zeus, and then he will bring back a golden age. And they, they refer to it as the second coming of Saturn. If you want to know more about this, uh, take a look at Derek Gilbert's book, The Second Coming of Saturn. Okay? But you can see how they play around. They will tell you, if you tell them, but listen, I believe in Jesus, then they will tell you, no, 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 no. You know, the church has lied to you, everybody has lied to you, the ministers, everyone, the Bible lies to you. Jesus is actually Jupiter, and Zeus is um, the demiurge who created everything, but he will come back, and um, he will displace Zeus, and he will bring us another golden age. And that is, that golden age of which they are referring to, which they are waiting for, is basically the new world order. Okay, that's when the Antichrist will reign in full swing. And they have this very romantic idea about it. The pagan religions and the occult and new age and what uh, all of them. Okay. So you have the throne of Satan, the throne of iniquity, the throne of destruction. It is a throne of lies from which a river of death flows forth. Okay. And that is why Jerusalem um, in the time of the prophet Zephaniah. Jerusalem was called the city that is soiled, defiled, and oppressing. Being soiled is being morally corrupt. Being defiled means you are so morally corrupt that you praise the lie and you hate the truth. Exactly what the prophet Isaiah warned the people against. And then obviously oppressing, oppressing people. And that's exactly what we will see when the Antichrist is seated on the throne of destruction, the throne of Satan. Okay? Um, does it mean that in our day and time the Antichrist will be seated physically in, in Turkey? Um, because remember Pergamum was one of the seven churches in Turkey, as it was called in those days Asia Minor. Not necessarily, but remember the, the, the key thing here. The key thing is remembering that the Antichrist will have a counterfeit throne, the throne of Satan or the throne of destruction. And he will be seated on it, and he will pretend to be God. And he will do it so cleverly that even the elect will be would have been deceived if the Lord did not shorten the days. It's it's um it's hectic stuff. It's not for the faint of heart, but you know. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, obviously you will not make it. Jesus was very clear when he said that those who endure until the end, I will save them. I, we will be with him in the new Jerusalem. People, this is why in our day and time you need to stay on your knees. You need to stay with your face in the word of God. Stick your nose in the word of God. Study it. Ask the Holy Spirit for discernment. Walk with Jesus. Live out the armor of God. Now, importantly, in Revelation 2 verse 16, he says, Repent therefore. What will happen if they don't repent? He says, Otherwise, if you don't repent, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of my mouth is... The word of God. So Jesus says, listen, if you don't repent, I will count you, you uh, church in Pergamum, I will count you among the evildoers. And I will destroy you along with the evildoers with the word of my mouth. I will destroy them with the word of my mouth, the word of God. In other words, I will destroy them with the truth. Because the forces of darkness hate and despise truth so much. That when Jesus, as the truth of God, stands before them, they will crumble and he will destroy them with the breath of his mouth. 
Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's significant that he says that because he's basically saying, don't lend out your ears to false teachings. Don't lend out your ears to the words of the false prophets. Don't lend out your ears to the one seated on the throne of iniquity, the one seated on the throne of Satan. To the one who is victorious, in other words, the one who endures to the end, who refuses to deny Jesus Christ, I will give some of the hidden manna. And here's an interesting part. It's interesting how he ends this. He says, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. What's interesting here is that, you know, when Jesus comes with his second coming, he also has a name uh, written on him. He tells us in Revelation 19, he has a name written on him that only he knows. Okay. When those who endure to the end, we will each be given a, a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now what's interesting here is a Greek philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, deceived the world. Okay, Just as the pagan ancient Greek mythology, the, you know, because it's actually all, it's, 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 a, it's a reverence of the Nephilim, those gods that they revered or fallen angels, Nephilim, and so on, okay? The Titans, and all those. In Greek philosophy, there's a concept, I think it was Aristotle that thought of that concept, it's called the tabula rasa. Tabula rasa means the clean table, the clean slate, the white slate. And he says that each person is like a white slate, and you should basically write your life story on the white slate. Jesus says, no, I will give you a white stone and on it will be written a name that only you know. Jesus is saying, I will give you a unique identity. I will renew you. You will receive a new body, a new mind, a new... You will be renewed. You will be reju rejuvenated with a long, with a holy secret name that only you will know and once again it's one of those things that with our human understanding we can't grasp it because it's so wonderful once again it is like paul says i think it's in romans chapter 8 he says that um nothing we cannot comprehend in any way i'm paraphrasing now but he, it comes down to he says we cannot comprehend in any way the things that God plans for us when we are when we leave this world and we go to <clears throat> the eternal life we cannot comprehend the life that we will have in the new Jerusalem we cannot comprehend the wonderfulness the the peace the um, the blessed peace the blessed calmness the wonderful atmosphere in the New Jerusalem. We, we can't comprehend it. Let me finish for us with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and we praise and we glorify your name. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Lord, we praise your name, Lord. You are the one worthy to receive praise we thank you for jesus we thank you for his crucifixion we thank you for his resurrection and his ascension lord we thank you for the holy spirit who works as guide comfort and protector in our lives lord please help us to keep our spiritual eyes open and our spiritual ears open that we will not be deceived lord please help us sanctify us in your truth your word is truth lord we ask that you Bless our minds, bless our bodies, bless our souls, Lord, and help us that our thoughts, our deeds, and our words will be to the glory of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, help us to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross daily and follow you daily, Lord. Lord, we ask that any attacks from 
the forces of darkness that you will ward them off, that you will hit the forces of darkness with blindness, with, mute, with muteness and death, deafness, Lord, that they will not be able to speak lies into our minds, into our thoughts, that they will not be able to attack us, Lord. And help us that we will live your word, not only study it, but make it part of our everyday life, Lord. Because we know that your word is the sharp double-edged sword. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is a discerner of the thoughts. Lord, we praise and we glorify you. We cannot thank you enough for your love, your mercy, your grace, your patience, your righteousness. And thank you for every time that when we fall into error that you correct us. Lord, thank you for your correction. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.